Mahmoud, could you tell me your full name, please? Uh, well, that's a long name, A.K.M. Mahbub Ullah. Mahbub, yeah, Mahbub. Mahbub yes, yeah. Yeah. So, Mahbub, could you tell me how old you are? I'm 56. So, now, Mahbub, before we move on to talk about COVID-19, I'm trying to find out more about you as an individual. Clearly, you're living in Britain, but tell me more about where you were born and your ch early childhood. <clears throat> I was born in a place called in Bangladesh, a place called in Bogra. That's the one of the district in Bangladesh. And then that was, I was born, but I was brought up in Dhaka city. I had education there. Uh, while I was in the first year in the university, I moved to England. And I've been living in England about 35 years now. So how many brothers and sisters do you have? Um, I got five more brothers and four sisters. So in total, that would be nine? Ten. Ten, oh, in total, ten including ten. me. Okay, ten. so ten siblings in total. Were they yeah. all born and brought up in Bogra? No. Well, brought up in all in Dhaka, mainly. But born, some of them born in Bogra and Rongpu, in the district called Rongpu. Uh, this is older generation. My, my brothers and elder sisters are. Oh, they were born in Rongpu and we were born in Bogra. Because my father was a mechanical engineer and he has a transferable job. So wherever you know, he used to go, so we were there. So there's somebody born there, somebody born here. I mean, here means, you know, like the different place of the country. So do you remember your early life? What it was like? Was it was it comfortable? Did you do you remember things that you did in Bangladesh? What was it like for you at an early early age? Oh uh, yes, I do. You know, I do because I do since the war in nineteen seventy one. I can remember from there. Yeah, life was there was uh, just smooth. I'm not saying that because being as uh, ten siblings, very comfortable with one earning. But you know, it, it was the middle class family, as you call it, at that time. So once the brothers and sisters they are gradually grown up, and after finishing the education, they got a job, and yeah, then we became a little bit comfortable in our life. Yes. So early life was very comfortable. Uh, most of the time in Dhaka father was working as an engineer and and you yourself said you went to you studied went to university what was the yeah. reason for going to university what was the underlying motive for going to university well you know the motive if you say very underlying motive then it is our culture education is the first things you do not the money so with 10 of us all my siblings you will see none of them none of them got less than degree. So some might have two degrees, some might have three degrees, some have four degrees. So education was our families or traditionally or my parents, they wanted it. And they said without, after finish education, then you think of earning, not before that. So that's why that has happened in our family. Yes, everybody's highly educated. And they, thanks God they're doing, you know, okay. That's what I'm gonna say. Could you imagine life without going through the intensive education that you have underwent, the life would have been and could have been? Well, if in Bangladesh, when we was teens, uh, you know, that was very difficult without education, was life was very difficult. But as time goes, the culture, society, everything has been changed and people are earning this way and that way a lot of different ways so they're getting comfortable um, so education sometimes education at the moment is not a bar to do your good living but when we grown up that time without education you are nowhere you will be very poor people but it's, it has been changed sure you mentioned this briefly about your early experience during the liberation movement, the independence of Bangladesh. How yeah. much do you remember? Obviously, it's a historical moment, isn't it, where a nation was formed. How, how much do you remember during that period? I do remember quite well because uh, I was about that time seven years old. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of things I remember. Yes, I have seen my own eyes, a lot of things. I have seen in front of me people who had got shot and dead. Um, you know, we was running because of the army was coming 
uh, from the plane. There was a you know, brush fire from the plane. So luckily, me, my brother and a sister, we survived. So I have seen my own eyes how people got killed. Killed by whom? Um, the Pakistani army? Yeah, or? Pakistani army, yeah. So when Bangladesh gained independence, mm. um, what was the atmosphere like whilst that happened? Well, people was um, very happy. You know, obviously it is something we wanted and it's been happened. But I think one thing I must tell, I don't know whether I should say that or not, but I can really, I suppose. We were celebrating, definitely. And when the Indian army was approaching with the tank and all those, yeah, there, some of them was good. Some of them was like that, you know, we are, it's not they're coming to help us. Like they are coming to, they, they came to our country. Like we are the subordinate, you know, of them. It's, it's sort of things like that. I feel at that time, I, I, whether I'm wrong or right, I don't know. But I feel, you know, the, the way they used to talk and they used to have the attitude. I, I felt, although I was seven years old, six years old, but I do feel that quite strongly I can remember. But, you know, we were very happy, politically, emotionally, and obviously everywhere, because the whole family, we was pro-democracy movement. And so obviously we were extremely happy over the moon. So where, as time went on, clearly the mm. nation is consolidating and trying to find its own feet and its mm. identity. And I presume you saw as the country was formulating its own identity. So from early on to later, what sort of changes did you see in, through your own eye? Um, the changes I have seen through all my own eyes, what I remember, the period I can tell you like, you know, 1972, 73, until 1984. I think that's uh, 12 years of time. Yeah, it has been a lot of been change. After liberation, we was thinking, you know, we, say we will be living in peace and heaven, but it didn't happen. It was a lot of corruptions in the community. I'm not saying of the officially because we don't know at that age, we don't know what is office and how it works. So I don't know at that age at all. What I have seen, a lot of killing within the community. You know, there is a, for me, everybody got a gun. And so there was a lot of killing around. So those are the things you was always scared. After evening, you, you know, people, you don't see many people outside of the home. So that, that's one sort of things. And uh, another things like we saw that other country who was in that time in war or other, you know, civil unrest. And we had a very common bonding. All those, we don't know those people. We don't know this country much about. But reading in the newspaper, learning from them, like I can remember, I can tell you like Vietnam, like in a Palestinian, a lot of our guys went to Palestinian to fight the freedom fighters. So these are the two I think I can remember. So at what point did you feel, or at what point did you feel that, okay, I've been in Bangladesh for a very long time, I've gained their education, I've learned the progress in or development of the country, but it's time for me to go explore the West. How did that happen? Well, if you say time to go back home to explore my learning, my experience and things like that. Yes, I did. I went back after finishing my MBA, which is Masters of Business Administration. Uh, I finished it in 1995. So did and you study in 1995 in Britain? Oh yeah, all the way through everything. My undergraduate until my two masters, everything all in, in Britain, yes. So, so, so what was the reason for coming to UK then? Oh, well, the first time I reasoned to coming to UK, I, in my family almost, you know, 70% are the engineer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I wanted to be in an engineer as well. I wanted to study nuclear engineering. That was my childhood wish. And I was, I, I was and I will not say I was top, in the country in terms of education, but I, I, you know, I was very good, very good in terms of physics, maths, and further maths and all those things. So I decided that I wanted to study nuclear engineering. So at that time in Britain, there was only one college you used to do that was called Queen Mary College under the London University. So I thought I will you know, come over here and study. 
And obviously at that time, they used to say that until you have a degree, you don't get undergraduate in this country. But I did, you know, it was a written communication with a uh, letter. I said, whatever the level of standard you guys have in your country, I would like to face. And I will show that I'm capable to do that. So they invited me. They said, okay, if you wanted to come for an interview, then you come. They called me for interview. I come over here. And, you know, after interviewing me, they said, which subject you would like to, you know, be interviewed? I said, I would prefer physics and maths. Yeah? So they gave me a few maths. They um, told me that if you achieve 70% of this, then you will have unconditional offer. And luckily, I got 100% out of not 70. Mm -hmm. So there was a bit shocked and said, how many students you have in your country like you? I said, they had quite a few, quite a few people. Anyway, so that's, that's, the way, that's the reason I came over here. And then because I was given the visa for only two months, and this, I told him, and he said, don't worry about that. The, we will see on that side. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they have looked after the side, but after a year or so, I couldn't continue. I found, I feel, well, I find out that my father hasn't got enough money to support me to study in this country. And so obviously he wants to sell the building we have in, in Dhaka City, and which I said, no, I can't do that from education. Um, I will continue my education, but I have to change my subject. So I have changed my subject to business studies. At that time, it was a hot cake as well. You know, I'm talking about 1986, 85, 86 at that time. So I changed my subject to business studies. Then I've done the DMAs, I've done the MBA, public, in PGC, and the MSc as well. From mm -hmm. the, so, you know, let's carry on one after one. Then, yeah, top time the education. <laughs> and I started to do my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a teaching in the University of East London, mm -hmm. it's a part-time lecturing. Mm -hmm. But I thought in 2000, year 2000, that you know, I need to go back to my country, and whatever I have achieved, I would like to share with my people. That's the morally I thought that point, which I went back. I left everything here. I went back, but I couldn't get. Well, not, not the Dhaka University, which I, first I wanted to go, but I couldn't get a job there, but I got other public sector university easily. I got a job, but uh, before a job started, one day I was picked up from the main road, you know, just a kidnapped. They hold me gun in point and they took me, you know, they kidnapped and they asked for ransom. Oh, so what? They kidnapped me for money? They kidnapped me for money, yeah. So what happened? And somehow I was lucky mm. that in those people where they're holding me, one of the guy, not their part, but somebody else outside, he recognized me and he came and asked me, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm not doing here. They're holding me here. So who? I said, these people. And then he has a conversation. And after that, he said, do you know who he is? So he introduced me to them. And then obviously, you know, my brother was a bit involved with the politically. So they, they knew him, probably he heard of his name. So they just said, oh, just, you know, the boys want something. Just give them something. So I had my, you know, whatever the money I had in my pocket, mm -hmm. probably about six, 7,000 taka, Bangladeshi taka. I've given it to them. I'll come back. And I was so worried in front of gunpoint and knife point. You can imagine how, you know, people can behave. So I just get the next available flight and say goodbye, Bangladesh. Okay. So yeah. whilst you're settling in Britain, um, and also I suspect exploring the world of Britain, what did you see? Uh, in what way was Britain different from what you see, have seen and exposed to in Bangladesh? Well, the first thing is the biggest thing, the social change between those countries and this country. Very difficult socially. Yeah, culturally. In what way? So, For example. So socially means you have a social security here. It means, you know, you can go at two o'clock in the morning, you can go and do things for what you want, you come back, nobody will touch you, nobody will ask you. Unless it was mid eighties, then it was a different issues at that point. But it has been changed a lot. 
Yeah, in like one thinks it's back things. All right, you are the part of the country. I'll say this is my country, in in Bangladesh. But when you come here, as I say, you feel oh, you are an outsider. Yeah, there I was abused, and twice I was hospitalized Why? by this, racial abuse. Where yes. was this? That's when Lucian. Right. And when was this? I think one is eighty nine or eighty eight, another one something like eighty nine or nineties. So that sort of time. So, so, so sorry to hear this, obviously. So, so tell me more. So what happened? So you're adjusting to the British life in Lewisham. And where else did you live? Well, I always live in Lewisham area. Mm-hmm. Uh, apart from where well, I was the university, I was in Cardiff. I was in like Hamel Hampstead. So uh, did you currently live in Lewisham then? Well, I was always been living in my you know, houses in Lewisham, but for the study reason, for the university reason, I might have, I have given it somewhere else. Okay. Just, and I stay for a few months or a year or things like that, but yeah. always been Lewisham. Go ahead. So carry on with your story. So what happened? So how did you settle down? And then slowly, slowly as time goes by, I started my you know, own business. At that time, I haven't thought of doing, go back to work, job. I thought I would do you know, like other Bangladeshi does, you know, open a restaurant, which I did with my, my friend. And you know, then I find out now it's very difficult. I got married, children just was born and restaurant life, it doesn't sit with that, you know, and the home life. It's a bit of a difficult situation. Why so can't give, you know, because, uh, you know, in the restaurant, you come, you finish half 12, one o'clock, you know, in the midnight. So, or midnight at the earliest, you could go home. So by the time you go home, everybody's sleeping. When you come out, they're gone, you are sleeping. So I decided that, you know, no more restaurant trade. And I think I wanted to start a job. And then I started applying all the places. And it was difficult as well to getting the job as well. And although you were highly qualified, but some reason uh, I didn't get enough response to get a job. So, so what sort of jobs were you applying for? Well, I was applying for a management job as well as the teaching, the lecturing. Um, in the further education as well as the university sector. So everywhere, everywhere suits where with my qualification, but most of the time, regret, 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 don't know why. So I changed my name. I, I, with my name, Mahbub Ullah, mm-hmm. yeah, aka Mahbub Ullah, if I made an application, say 100, I didn't get probably even zero answer, you know, interview or response even. Just well, what was the name before? And, and, uh... Mahabubullah. Mahabubullah is my name, real name. But, you know, uh, if you don't want need to change, obviously you know very well that, the surname, then you can call yourself anything. Mm-hmm. So I just changed. Rather than Mahabub, I've said, okay, what I put, say, put Michael and see how it goes. Michael mm-hmm. Ullah. Mm-hmm. And believe me, if I apply with Michael Ullah 100, I will get response at least 60. I don't know. I'm not complaining. I'm not judging anybody or uh, any things, but that was the response I had. So you genuinely saw the difference in response from employers the moment you changed your name? Yeah, uh, that's what I think. That's what I'm saying. You know, if I had application with Mahabub Ullah, I get zero response. If I have a Michael Ullah, I got about 60% response. Well, that's good. So, so clearly that has helped you to break the doors and Really yeah, really obviously, and then I into yes. So I have, what happened yes. now? Because you changed the name, you got yourself a job, and then what happened? Well, I still am in a job, carrying on doing it. I'm working for NHS now, as you know. So uh, I am, yeah, I'm happy with my current position, with everything. I'm, 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 I will say that yes, I am okay now. Settled down in a safe and secure job. Uh, with decent money, yes, I, I'm, I'm okay now, I'm happy. So, Mahabu, what do you do for the NHS? I work for project, NHS runs a project, one of the projects called Live Well Project, What's which that? is about you looking into the public health problem we face, like uh, alcohol abuse, problem we say that smoking, problem we see the uh, health issues other like you know your living condition like your obesity all those together five things together the public health 
they have created the project called Live Well, mm -hmm. and I run that project. Yes, I do. Um, we 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 see those people, particularly not in terms of outside of the in, within the community. We see the people who comes to our hospital uh, with all our problems, and so we advise them. We make sure you know these people can be safe and good health. So just before the lockdown, mm. what was your day-to-day -day activity at work? Um, well, I worked for nine to five and I personally myself, I used to run about nine clinic in a week. So I have almost every day two clinic uh, except Monday. Monday I got only one clinic. By morning I do train, I used to train people, particularly those people, um, F1 doctors, nurse, midwife, and others, um, newcomer in the trust. So train them for you know, how we get involved, how we can advise people, how to recruit people, how to communicate uh, within ourselves and share the data. So every alternative Monday, I used to do that. And we also have uh, the clinic within the ward by ward setting in the ho hospital. Mm -hmm. So my colleague used to do that. And I do this. That's that's I've been doing uh, for three years, mm -hmm. just more than three more than three years now. Okay, so now that's obviously in terms of your work. So now tell me more about your family life and personal life. What was that like before the lockdown? Uh, before the lockdown, yeah, I've been always been busy because children are, you know, schools and sometimes. We used to wake up very early in the morning, say half past five, six o'clock you know, in the morning to prepare the lunch for all five of us. We've got three children and two of us. So, you know, drop them to the station so they can go, come back, get ready. And we just went to the hospital and do come back again. And th th that's why I do a little bit of gardening myself. So keep busy that way. And other things, they're helping the kids as well, you know, make sure that they're doing very well. Thankfully, my son, he done very well in GCC. You know, he done one of the top in the country. And in A-level, he got the same. He's doing four A-level. And thankfully, he's going to get all four A star. And he got a medical. He's going to go to uh, King's College Medical School. And yeah, my children are doing fantastic in the day school. So what are we doing? I think, you know, uh, we're doing okay. Good. So it looks like it, things were okay and are okay. But once the lockdown kicked yeah, in, yes. what sort of changes and how do you feel about it? The change changed the life, yeah, quite a lot, actually. Uh, everybody, they can't go you know, out, they're going to go to school or things like that. That's one part of them. And particularly my point, my side, I do suffer from a um, few common problems like... You know, I got high blood pressure, I got diabetic, I got uh, asthma. So it was very difficult. We, it, once it's locked down and it is very hard, you know, everywhere, whole communities like, it's like a Sahara, you know, deserts. You don't see any people within that, even the neighbor, you don't see even neighbor, nobody going out, things like that. And then, you know, don't go anywhere, do you know, shopping. So I done the shopping before it's locked down. So I was okay. Then I got a letter from my doctor, GP, that I should be shielding. They want me to do shielding for three months. Mm -hmm. So then sh that's, that's happening. I'm shielding now, still now. I don't go out. I don't do anything. So Just staying at home. How are you coping shielding? You know, because in everybody of us, all five of us at home, mm -hmm. you know, keeping busy as myself, watching movies, watching this, talking to people, friends, and you know, we have a, every, um, like a dinner time, we had a family meeting every day, different, different topics. And then my, my wife is a doctor as well. So we have a discussion about that, you know, how that could happen, how the vaccination works, what sort of things can be involved with the vaccination research. So, so many different, different topics. We have a topics every day. <laughs> we can't go out. Nobody can come into my place and we can't go anywhere either because I'm shielding. Okay. So, um, so whilst you're shielding, I mean, have you heard stories about how, 
um, your family members. Mother died of COVID-19. Yeah, she, she died on 12th of April mm. and Easter Saturday. Yeah, both a lot of friends, uh, not the, in the relatives, but a lot of friends. They, like even today, this afternoon, one of my very close friends, I knew him for the last 35 years. His mother died today mm. and it's COVID-19 as well. So, and you know, other friends on friends, their friends, it's, it's like that. Yes, within our community, there's a lot of people died. Yes. Do you know what the ages they were? Uh, some people age is about 45 till 890s, you know, not like 85, 45 to 85. Do you know they had any other health conditions? Some of them, none at all, because particularly I know a couple of people, they have no health condition prior to this. Two of them I knew without any health condition, they died. Mm. And others, yes. So in terms of, I guess, um, let's say the whole experience of the lockdown and COVID-19, in what way has your outlook changed in the way you see things? Yeah, but I think the so whole social, um, not only socially changed only, I think there were a lot of cultural issues as well is changing. What do you mean cultural issues changing? Cultural issue like, you know, the religion festival, you cannot mm -hmm. go do, you cannot attend, you cannot see your uh, friends and family. You know, people, when somebody is in detached for a quite a long time mm -hmm. for that, other perception does change. A lot of people, you know, they say, oh, well, that's all right. Doesn't matter really, you know, things like that. The culture and religious live does. I mean, uh, do you go to mosque if to pray in the past? Or, I mean, has that changed? I mean, what's going on? No, I, I, I will say, you know, that I never went for, you know, to mosque to pray except Eid time. Mm -hmm. uh, but others, uh, I mean, the other friends and family, they, you know, they, they think that way. A lot of people, they just don't listen. They just wanted to go. But thanks God that when it's completely closed, the mosque closed, that's the only time they say, all right, then because they cannot go, they're not going. Otherwise, if it's open, they will go. Doesn't matter. They will not understand. There's, you know, how dangerous this virus could be. Mm -hmm. I think the lack of communication uh, within our society, our culture, you know, in Bengali culture, Bengali society in this country, uh, and a lot of stigma about it, you know, if people perception think that, oh, if you tell somebody else about your, you know, family, friends about the COVID, or oh, those are bad people, you know, they look yeah. down. And uh, these are the changes I can see. You know, a lot of people, they don't like to say that their parents or friends yeah. or family member dies of COVID. It's all oh, due to other complications they die. Mm. They even prepare to lie, you know. Mm. This is this is a lot of things. Yeah. It's a big change. How things have changed in terms of work for you? In terms of work, you know, not much change really because uh, I used to say like, you know, I had my own clinic, face-to-face mm. -face people. I used to see a lot of people communicating, talking to them. I, mm -hmm. I like, you know, meeting new people, talk to them, all different issues, different topics. But yeah. now, uh, although I'm working Monday to Friday, nine to five, but all is online. So, so are you coping with that? You feel different, yeah, but I don't see, you know, that big difference, really. I, mm. I look at it, this is responsibility. I need to help these people now more than ever, you mm. know. So I try to keep myself quite busy talking mm. to those people, giving advice, sending medication. I have arranged, you know, with the pharmacy that, you know, what about the prescription I'm giving, please arrange a delivery with them. I think, yes, I, I felt myself that I'm doing, you know, I'm happy with what I'm doing for the people in the community. Yeah. So, so family-wise then, in what way <coughs> your family relationship has changed as a result of the lockdown? Nothing, really. I can say with my personal family life, we are, you know, quite all sensible and all, and all the, my children are teen, but they, you know, their mature, the mental age is over thirty. Mm -hmm. So you know that helps a lot because I I put them you know since the childhood from the since the primary, I always make them you know the eyes to talk. Okay, talk about next week your job to do you know findings about the TV 
mm. about the cancer, about this, and make a presentation and say it in front of what is you think, what is you know, give the background, what mm. you think, pros and cons, and questions. Mm. So I did practice all this with my children since they are in the primary. Mm -hmm. So you can think their mental age now. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people say, oh, you, you know, they haven't seen their teen. They haven't enjoyed their teenage. I said, I haven't stopped them, but I'm giving more you know, knowledge than they might require. Well, yes, I accept that I have done that. They don't need these activities, but it helps them to build up their life. And I think build up the social activities and they knew the people's pain. In particular, because all my children, they all three want to be in medicine career. So well, it helps them, their career, I think. Mm. Well, Mahmoud, what can I say? Thank you for allowing me to interview because your story, you know, that is very powerful. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Ripon. Thanks for inviting me.